nice and given extra answers when it really wasn't probably the best answer. Um, I know it was a tough test. Terminology is tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough. It's a big, big section of the um, the exam. So uh, I do think the next test will be easier, better. Um, at least for some, uh, it should just strictly be uh, Plinman and uh, Farm, and not as much of the you know ABG. I can't help you on those topics, SLE, lupus, um, asthma, and chronic bronchitis, and so it's uh, lupus. Um, the others are, are obstructive disorders. Um, there was one, it was where you had to calculate a um, 22 year old woman brought to the ER, has type 1 diabetes. We hadn't been on insulin for the past two weeks, was unresponsive, gave the weight, and had altered respirations, gave the finger stick, which was quite high, um, ABG gases results, and the, the answers were respiratory and metabolic acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, and pure metabolic acidosis and it was pure metabolic um, he did accept the respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis I mean we know metabolic acidosis for sure with the diabetes can you give us the lab results now uh, pH was 7.22 PaO2 was 92 PCO2 was 34 and by far it was 30. Was that because the BGC or the CO2 was right under 35? Is that why? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. If you actually yeah. did the so math on it, it came out as pure metabolic. But we did give credit for the both. Another one that was just incorrect was uh, another one of Dan's. The 52 year old woman brought to the ER. Uh, increasingly confused over the past 24 hours. Uh, medical history, severe renal failure due to lupus. Um, does dialysis three times a week. And uh, had anemia, evidence of renal failure, blood gases, blah, blah, blah. Um, the answers were the calculated pH based on the respiratory component should be 7.36. The patient is in respiratory acidosis. The patient needs approximately 230 milli equivalents of sodium bicarb. Oh, I thought you were saying easier. Bro, <laughs> <laughs> it's all exciting. <laughs> and then uh, based on the uh, PCO2, PACO2, the patient most likely is to kick Nick. That was the correct answer, but actually C was the correct answer too, because he calculated it and it came up to be like two or something just within that ballpark. So yeah, so we need to key that or change that answer. And um, 
Are the grades already updated to so yes. 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 We've already I mean, So they pinned it on Spain because they were neutral, right? Spain was willing to admit how many people died. They were losing a million people also. So we just pinned it on Spain. We didn't want to look like we were the cause. Germany didn't want to look. So we just pinned it on the neutral people. It was Spanish. It was great, right? Even back then, there was a PR machine. So um, at that point, the world lost almost 5% of its population, between 3 and 5% of the population. Um, that's more than we lost during the entire World War, right? So we lost almost 700,000 people to the flu. We only lost... 53,000 people in battle in World War I. So, during the entire four years of the Black Death, there were about 50 million deaths from the Black Death in four years, and there were about 50 million worldwide deaths from the flu. So, the flu's been around for a long time, and it's still pretty serious. So, um, these posters were out then, we knew then, that coughed and sneezed spread disease, right? Um, you can see that during the war years and the flu years, our population life expectancy dropped by a full 15 years of life expectancy due to the flu and the war. And it took us 10 years to get back up to our life expectancy, uh, mostly due to the flu and the war. Um, so this is a little uh, rhyme the kids used to sing when they were playing like Ring Around the Rosie. I had a little bird, her name was Enza. I opened a window at Influenza. <laughs> <laughs> they did this while doing Double Dutch and playing Ring Around the Rosie. Yeah, this little, little poem to make you remember. So you get a little history, you get a little science. Okay, so uh, influenza is actually 
a single-stranded RNA virus from the Orthomyxoviridae family, which don't worry, you'll never have to know again. Um, it affects mammals and birds, um, you know, including seals, right? There's certain influenza that only affects seals. I know, right? So, um, again, now we'll be testing about it again. But uh, there's three genera. There's influenza A, B, and C. Um, this is all based on the hemagglutinins and the neuraminase. We'll talk about that in a second. So we know there's about three to five million cases annually on a normal year. A few more this year, a few more last year, a few less in 2016. We know that on average, around 200 to 500,000 people die of the flu. Um, and that average is about 5 to 20 percent on a given year. Uh, Americans are going to catch the flu. Um, and somewhere around a quarter million are going to be hospitalized. Now, that was up a lot this year. Almost half a million were hospitalized this year. It's about 450,000 were hospitalized this year. Around 35,000 are going to die from the flu or flu-related. Now, very few people die from the flu. We'll talk about how you die from the flu, but most die from flu-related complications, right, pneumonia, things like that. Uh, and that was up a little bit this year. It was around 50,000 to die from flu and flu-related causes this year. We know those are usually extremes of age, right? The elderly were very young. And that was true this year, uh, this flu strain. Oh, we know like H1N1 affects more of the kind of the healthy young people, but this year's was more of the extremes, the typical ones. All right, so this is last year's total, 2,150 hospitalizations and 68 deaths. That was last year. This year, 2018, there were 4,553 hospitalizations and 253 deaths just in Oklahoma. So you can see the difference just in one year. So we almost tripled the number of deaths, 253 deaths this year and 4,500 hospitalizations. Um, and again, it looked about the same. The breakdown looked about the same. It was vastly the elderly and the very young uh, that were hospitalized and died. And again, the peak looked about the same. We had a peak. The peak was moved over just a little bit to the left. It started a little bit earlier in January and February. And we're actually still in flu season. We still see flu. I saw one last night when I was working. I saw flu B. Um, we peaked early in flu A. Um, now we're into flu B. Um, still seeing flu B. I haven't seen flu A for weeks and weeks. We should know how it spread. Um, you know, you guys are sitting nice and close to each other. You know, you guys, I'm sure. No, you probably didn't. When you were small, didn't have a TV show on PBS 321 Contact. They started off with like this was like 321 Contact on PBS. Started off with this slide. Like they showed a guy coughing, and I'll, I'll never forget. It traumatized my life. <laughs> Every time somebody coughed in elementary school, you kind of like ducked. Um, it's spread through aerosol transmission. It can live on fomites. It can live on desks and hard surfaces, although it's just not a very good vector for it. So we do wipe down things with those wonderful wipes and Clorox wipes and all that. You're most infective on the second and third day that you have it, as that virus is reproducing in, in, in you, although you're still infective 10 days out. Okay? So that's why we give people, we tell people to stay at home for 10 days. You know? Just get you feeling better and you're febrile. Don't go back to work. Don't go back to school. Um, you're still infected. You still should be sleeping in a different bedroom, different room, different house for 10 days. I cannot get my kids to understand that. Don't give me a hug. I love you, but I have to work. You know? um, so frozen virus, we know it can survive essentially forever. Right? We actually store these viruses um, indefinitely different strains of them. Um, and they are inactivated if you heat them up to 56 degrees, 132 degrees. So if you want to, you know, bake yourself to get rid of it, that's good. <laughs> and they're also inactivated at very low pHs. All right. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, I kind of want to skip, I had this, I changed it up a little bit. So. They are identified by their HA and NA proteins. So the hemagglutinin and the neuroadminidase proteins on the capsule, on the viral capsid outside of them. And we identify them, um, the little spiky parts and the little part with the ball on them is how we identify them. The hemagglutinin protein on the outside of them is what allows the virus to go inside your cell and begin to replicate the hemagglutinin part. 
That's what allows it to gain entry into your cell. That's the first, that's the H part, right? The H whatever in whatever. So the hemagglutinin, the, the neuroaminidase, the end part of it, is what allows it to break out of the cell afterwards and become infected. That's what lyses and cleaves the saccharides of the infected cell and allows the cell to be released and spread. So when we talk about how to treat these viruses a little bit, we'll talk about neuroaminidase inhibitors, like uh, Tamiflu and those kind of things. They act on the neuroaminidase, trying to keep it from being leaked out of the cell and released. But we identify viruses by their H's and their N's. So, oh great, we have different color chalks. If I was a teacher, right, I love chalk. <laughs> so, um, you take a virus, or a couple of viruses. It's got to be even familiar. So we have each virus in the inside of it has eight strands of single-stranded RNA. It's not one strand of RNA, it's eight different strands of RNA. They code for 11 proteins. So you're going to have four, of each one for the H's and the A's, essentially. So we're going to have an H1 N1, essentially. It's got H's and, A's, the H's and N's coded in the RNA, the single-stranded RNA. I'm going to play two of them. All right. Now we have an H5 N2. We're going to go for it in a second. All right, we'll get to this in a second. So, this is how we tell all the different types and subtypes of these flu vaccine, of these flu viruses. We type them by their outer proteins, the H's and N's. We subtype them by their inner proteins, by their inner RNA. All right, so that's how we get all these different things. So let's go back here for a second. All right, so we know that the influenza A, it infects humans, it affects mammals, it affects birds, and it's by far the most virulent of all these different genres of the A, B, and C. It causes the most severe disease. It's present every single year, and it's the one that you're going to find in the pandemics, the epidemics, um, the ones that are going to cause by far the most disease. Please don't memorize this, it's okay. It goes through a life cycle, it infects everything. Here's the deal. There's 17 H types and there's 9 N types. This is all of them listed out. You'll see that essentially only 3 H's and 3 N's affect humans. But all of them affect what? Birds, right? Birds are a common host for all these things. And then you have the sealed ones, right? <laughs> the H6 or the H7 N7, which there is a new one that's some kind of H6N6 that just got found in one person ever last year. So we're not going to talk about that. The person survived, they're fine. It's never been found again. It's, it's a really weird thing. So there's 17 H types. There's nine N types. We know that the four big ones have been confirmed as causing pandemics. The H1N1, H2N2, H3N2, which was this year's big one, H3N2, the Hong Kong one and the H5N1. And that's the one we're really worried about, the H5N1. This is the, the bird flu right now that we're really worried about causing a huge pandemic. So, there is this concept called antigenic drift and antigenic shift. And this is what all this led up to here. So, if we look at, this is time, and this is change. Influenza A is scary because it can undergo antigenic shift. Influenza B can only go antigenic drift. So what happens if we froze the virus like we can do, there would be no change in that virus over time. However, influenza B undergoes antigenic drift. It's RNA, and we know that RNA, unlike DNA, doesn't have that proofreading, right? Does it have a double-stranded opposite proofreading concept? So over time, there's little mistakes that get made. 
And this leads to antigenic drift. Slight variances in the RNA of influenza B, and to some extent influenza A. This is what allows you to get influenza B and have some immunity to influenza B throughout your life. However, you can get influenza B later if the drift has been enough. Okay? So there is some immunity. You get influenza B when you're a kid or a young adult, and you don't get it for 10, 15, 20 years until there's a drift of a different kind. Influenza A is a whole different piece because you saw all the different, you saw the little life cycle that goes through different things. So what will happen is, this will go into a different host, and this will go into a different host, and they'll go into a cell. And unfortunately, I'm going to get my colors right, it will take some of this, get all these right, and end up with a whole new virus. And what comes out of this is now an H5N1. So it comes out, and I can't get you. <laughs> it's going to come out pink, right, from the H1, and it's going to come, or from the N1, N1 it's blue. See? <laughs> this is art and not science. This is it. It's going to come out blue from the H5, this part. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I was up 24 hours yesterday on the shift. Oh. I slept uh, two hours today. Um, so the N1 from here, and it's going to come out orange from the H5. And now you've got a new strain. And this is what happens, and you saw that life cycle as it goes to a different host. It gets mixed up, and this is the antigenic shift. I lost my H5. This is blue. 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 Well, we're missing it again. No, it's fine. Right. <laughs> so it comes out as a whole new issue. And this is antigenic shift. So you get a little bit of drift over time, and then you have a huge jump in the change, and a little more drift, and a big jump. And this is shift. And this only happens in flu A. And this is why we have pandemics. This is why we don't have a lot of immunity to influenza A, and this is why we have such problem developing vaccines for this, is because it not only undergoes shift, it undergoes antigenic drift also. Okay? So again, the shift is large mutations over a very short period of time. The drift is very short mutations over a small period of time also. So, um, and again, it goes back to this whole life cycle of, we get this reassortment virus up here, usually in birds is where it happens. When you have the mixed up RNA, it spits out a whole new virus, an antigenic shift. And then, oh, wonderful, we get this pandemic reassortment, this new virus that comes out of it, this antigenic shifted virus. Okay? So this is really important, this idea of shift and drift, and influenza A being the one that's really the problem. That's why H3N2 is so bad, H1N1 has been so bad. Influenza B, much more mild. There's only one species that's influenza B. It, is, it exclusively infects humans. Again, this is why there's no shift. It exclusively affects us. It doesn't go through that avian reassortment. You know, it doesn't go into other species and gets reassorted. It just affects us. It mutates much slower, right? It's just, it drifts over time. And over time, it drifts enough that we lose our immunity. That our antibodies, right? So these H's and A's, these are very antigenic, right? This is what we make our antibodies to. These are these proteins are very antigenic. So we make antibodies to these. This is what we're making up our immune system to. So over time, it changes enough that we're no longer immune to it, and we have to make up a new antibody. So we all of a sudden become, you know, we catch. Influenza B again. <coughs> and again, usually some immunity acquired at early age. All right, C, nobody gets it. It's very mild. Um, we don't even know we get it. We usually have little body aches or you know, something like that. And there's no testing, no normal testing that does it. It has to be sent out to a specialty lab that does it. The CDC does keep track of it. You can look it up on their website. But it's, 
unbelievably rare. It's usually caught by accident when we're looking for something else. Um, okay, so we went over that. We talked about this. So this, this past year is almost exactly the same as last year. Um, for the first 10 weeks of the flu season, it was 90% influenza A, H3, N2. And then we switched and became influenza B. So, all right. So here's the big difference we're talking about. Based on the HA protein, the hemagglutinin protein, remember this is the one that gets the, the virus into your cell. Based on the HA protein, this is where it's going to infect you. Certain hemagglutinin proteins have an affinity for the upper respiratory or the lower respiratory system. H1 primarily affects the upper respiratory system, causing coryza, rhinorrhea, um, you know, a lot of upper respiratory systems. It tends to be a bad flu, makes you have a bad head cold, sneezing, all these kind of things. It's rarely fatal and easily spread because you're sneezing like crazy. You're blowing your nose, you're runny nose, you're wiping, your kids wiping their nose on their hands and, and touching the doorknobs and everything else. H5 and H3 tend to affect the lower respiratory system, the lungs. So it's a little less infective until you start coughing like crazy. But it tends to be more fatal because you have a higher incidence of pneumonia. So remember that HA, that hemoglobin protein, is what tells you where it's going to bind, what cells it's going to affect, what the affinity is, and ultimately what its, uh, what its virulence and what its um, fatality and mortality is. Okay, so it's, just knowing what is out there each year, you can kind of tell how sick people are going to be and what their sickness is going to be. Now, of course, people with H1N1, they're going to get pneumonia. People with H5 are going to get a lot of head colds, too. But, you know, in general, we can talk about it. All right. So why does, why do people die of the flu, of the flu? Why do health people die of the flu? Why do people in this room die of the flu, especially things like H1? Because you guys have awesome immune systems. That's the problem. Like if you guys were just a little sicker and weaker and ill and fragile and frail, you guys would be better. Yeah, so what happens is it knocks out, you actually have what's called a cytokine storm. You guys have too much of an immune response, right? Yeah. Wait, I, I got confused. Yeah. Oh, wait, never mind. It's okay. <laughs> no, it's on the, it's on the screen. I don't it's okay. Not it. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yeah, so you guys actually have an overreaction of your immune system, right? So you have a cytokine storm. As that, as that flu virus infects your lower respiratory tract, especially that H5, N3, H5, N1, um, H3, N2, those ones that affect the lower respiratory system, you actually have a cytokine storm. Your body releases over 150 immune and uh, inflammatory markers. And you actually essentially produce like an ARDS response. We'll talk about ARDS in a minute, but you essentially build up this flu in your lungs. You have an over-inflammatory response. Your airways become constricted with mucus and all this kind of stuff. Um, and you just have this huge cascade of overwhelming response from your immune system. You have an over-response to your immune system. Um, and then your body shuts down. The, the ACTH cortisol gets shut down as an inhibitory feedback. And so that stress response that started off so strong then shuts down. And you don't have the stress response that you do. So it becomes this inhibitory feedback loop. Cytokine storm starts up and then it just shuts down. And your body can't respond like it should. So unfortunately, that's why healthy people from these, some of these, um, if you're going to die from the flu, that's why you die. Now, most people we know don't die from the flu. They die from secondary things, the pneumonias. Um, ARDS, URI stuff, people that are, that's why they, the elderly and young. So you're saying you're, you, you die because you aren't even having a response, you have no idea? The, the people like us? Like we'll have a response so we'll know we're sick versus Correct. the elderly who don't have it and they'll just... So they'll go through the flu part first. They'll get sick and achy and all that. And typically we'll see them, the mistake is we'll see them and say you have the flu. You're fine. Go home, drink fluids, you know, maybe take, take Tamiflu or whatever. But then they'll get that secondary pneumonia, and they'll end up dying from that a week, 10 days, 14 days later from that. Yeah. Um, and that's the problem. So they don't die from the flu itself. They don't get that overwhelming response like we get. Um, 
their body doesn't handle well, their bottle handles flu well, it's whatever happens after that. And we'll talk a little more about the arts. <laughs> You said that our body kind of shuts down or inhibits that stuff. That's the second part, yeah. For us who are healthy, mm -hmm. whenever we do shut down and we inhibit that, does that allow for the virus to replicate like crazy? It does. Crazy, and that's how we die from it. It does keep going, yeah. yeah. And again, we'll talk a lot more about the arts lecture and kind of these secondary problems. Yeah. And it's and so one of the things that just came out, the paper just got released today, is called the AFORS trial, um, looking at using huge doses of steroids um, in sepsis based on uh, viral infections. Um, it's the second big trial for critical care, but giving people huge doses of steroids in the ICU when they are sick like this because their own levels are so low. We've tried it before, but this is a whole new level of it. We've just given them tons of it. And giving them vitamin C, IV vitamin C also, uh, to help their immune system in the ICU. So these are new things in the last couple years. The paper got released today. So. Um, yeah, I mean, to try to boost that immune system that they're shut down. All right, so we know, gosh, you know, if you lived through this year, you know what the presentation is, right? So an abrupt onset of fever, that's kind of a big one, right? That's what tells you it's a fever, or that's because it's a flu and not a cold, right? Is the abrupt onset of fever. You got hit by a truck today. Um, <laughs> the chills, the rigors, the shivering. Um, cough, nasal congestion, coryza, rhinorrhea. Um, malaise, myalgias, everything hurts. You just want to lay down, you don't want to move, you don't want to roll over. Um, you just can't get out of bed, sore throat, headache, flushing. And then, depending on, B is a little more GI predominant. Flu B has a little more GI predominance than flu A, but both of them can have GI symptoms. The nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, especially in kids. Um, so, you just feel like crap, you like get hit by a bus. And again, uh, that's the difference between the flu and cold, right? Mm -hmm. Flu hits like that. Cold tends to, to build up. These are all the flus? All Except flus. for C. Oh, yeah, exactly. C, you just kind of like had a bad day. It really is very bad. Kind of like you today after 24 hours. Just had a bad day. Influenza, I mean, you know, you really do know. Uh, cold, it's kind of a couple of days. It gets worse and worse and worse. The flu hits you all of a sudden. Um, cold has very few GI symptoms, again, the flu, if you're a kid, you typically, we've seen a lot this year of the kids with the GI symptoms and the flu, tend to be a lot more common this year. Um, you're, just not, you're just not worn out with the, the cold like you are with the flu, the flu just wipes you out. Came in a bit. All right, so uh, the best way to take care of the flu is not to get it. Um, I know, right? Seems simple. Um, hibernate for the winter. We know the vaccine is <coughs> sporadically effective. Its efficacy varies every year. Um, this year was ridiculously poor. Um, I've seen everything from 10% to 30%. I don't know. I got it. I saw. I think we saw 300 cases of flu in our in our shop. I never got the flu. I got lucky. Either guy got lucky or. I don't know if the vaccine works. So we know it's, it's uh, efficacy varies wildly every year. We base it on what comes out of the, of the Far East, out of Australia, uh, out of the Southern Hemisphere every year. We try our best to see what's coming. Um, we typically make it trivalent. We pick the three strains um, of flu A and one strain of flu B um, and put those together um, and try our best, but it doesn't always work. Because even from there to here, we can get antigenic drift. Um, it's typically an inactivated virus, so no, you can't get the flu from a flu vaccine, right? We should all know that by now. We should all call patients that you can't get the flu from the flu vaccine. You can get a mild reaction, right? You can get a little achy, you can get a little fever, you can get a little, that's just your rea immune reaction anyway from anything. Um, we do have the live attenuated vaccine that we give kids, right? The intranasal vaccine. You can get the flu from that, yes, but it's a, a very attenuated vaccine, so the chances are very slim. Um, we know that uh, some, like the H5N1, actually any of the H5s are very difficult. Um, actually, in, all the N1s and most of the H5s are difficult. The N1s, remember the neuraminidase is what releases the vaccine. So the neuraminidase is very hard to grow in eggs. They tend to just break the eggs, the little cells, before they actually are ready. 
because that's what lyses them, and so they don't really grow well. Um, and then the H5 doesn't like reproduce well inside eggs. It's, so it's really difficult to make all the H's and H5 and all the N1s in cell in eggs. So we're not very good at making those. They've proven very difficult to make. Um, and just anybody should get the vaccine. Everybody should get the vaccine. So um, I have a question. So yeah. in you said earlier with the immune system raising a response in your bodies to the H proteins. Mm -hmm. In vaccines, you're getting that same immune response. So even if the vaccine doesn't work mm -hmm. that year, if you had 10 years of the vaccines, right. would that be a benefit? There is. And we've, they've looked at that. TDC has talked about that. Just getting the vaccine, we think, has some benefit, even if it's not the right one. That you have some um, crossover, that you have some um, adjuvant benefit to it, just by getting the vaccine that either you get less of it, so we think that uh, your symptoms are lessened, um, that you help someone by getting the vaccine, even if it's not the right one, um, that there's some protection even from a vaccine, even if it's not the right vaccine. So yeah, so we think that people in 2009 who actually had the Spanish flu um, did far better or didn't get the Spanish flu because they had been exposed to the Spanish flu and didn't get it in 2009. Even though there was a great difference between the Spanish flu in 1918 and 2009, almost 100 years So those people who lived through that had some resistance despite great genetic drift. So there's something, our immune system can recognize some of this protein somewhat. So even getting the vaccine helps. It helps somewhat, even if it's not the right one. So I strongly urge everybody to get it. Yes? Is it true when they say if you get the vaccine and then you don't get the vaccine, you're more susceptible to getting the flu that year? I don't know. I haven't heard that. I don't know. I have to look. I don't know. Um, so there's some myths, obviously. So Guillain Barre, we know about that, right? You have a higher incidence. You have a higher background incidence of getting Guillain Barre um, from getting diarrhea than you do from having uh, the flu vaccine. So if you get diarrhea, right? So Campylobacter, things like that, that actually cause Guillain Barre. Your background incidence of just living is higher than actually getting the flu vaccine. Um, yeah. So. Um, most of them are no longer made with thimerosal. Most of them don't have mercury anymore. So, the, the flu vaccine is actually very, very safe. So. Um, especially if you're one of the immunocompromised elderly type group. All right. So, what about uh, cures? Well, there's no cure for the flu. It's a virus, right? Yeah. Good question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the adamantines, which sounds like Captain America's shield, but it's not. <laughs> Uh, the adamantines, which are the ones we use for uh, like HSV and all those other things, um, these are these are uh, completely uh, ineffective. Um, so this is you know all of your typical antivirals. Um, these have no effect whatsoever. They block M2 ion channels. They're supposed to prevent this, the virus from getting in the cell, but they don't work at all against them. Um, the re resistance is is off the charts. Um, they just the influenza viruses are completely, um, have worked completely around them. So, um, and influenza B doesn't have M2 ion channels. So. so, the next thing we worked on was the neuraminidase inhibitors. And that's, remember, that's trying to keep the virus from leaving the infected cell. So, trapping it, essentially making it bacteri uh, bactericidal, or bacteriostatic, and not bactericidal. So, letting it infect your cell but never releasing, which is um, one idea. So, this is your Tamiflu, Relenza and the new Rapavab that came out last year. Um, so, uh, I, so it's like one of these PSA things. I'll tell you now that I don't prescribe Tamiflu. I think I wrote two, maybe three prescriptions for it this year. Out of, you know, six months, 300 cases, I think I wrote three prescriptions for it. Um, so, I do a lot of evidence-based medicine and all that. And so, I'll tell you that officially the CDC recommends it for people who are at high risk for serious influenza complications. Um, and that is, and I have no conflict of interest. I, I mean, I, you know, I have four kids and two houses. I can't sell my house in New York still. I still pay two mortgages. I'd love to have a conflict of interest if you know of any. <laughs> um, but I don't. So uh, there's no conflict of interest. Um, there's just been a big issue with Tamiflu over the years. Um, Roche, uh, Roche Pharmaceuticals, who originally made it, did not release all of, I'll give you this real quick, did not release all the patient data on it. So when they got the 
trials done. They did all these trials on thousands of people. And then they brought it to market and said, look, it works. It stops, it stops the flu, it stops complications, it stops transmission. If you give it prophylactically, people don't get the flu. It, it's wonderful. And in 2009, when H1N1 hit, they said everybody should buy it. And the US and other governments bought billions of doses of it and stockpiled it. Well, the European Drug Council and other, and other people like Cochrane Review said, well, we want to see the data on this, and Roche wouldn't give it to them. And they said, we want to see the patient data on this, not the aggregated data. We want to see the patient level data. Uh, patient for patient, what happened? And Roche said, no, we won't do it. So the, the European Drug Council finally sued them, and they got patient level data. And it turned out that they released about 20% of the data in their trials. They kept 80% of the back. So when they looked at it, when Cochrane Review looked at their data, ended up that it didn't do anything. The Tamiflu didn't do anything to the flu. It doesn't even work on the neuroaminidase protein like it's supposed to. So Cochrane Review came out a couple years ago and said, we don't recommend Tamiflu at all. Cochrane said this. Now CDC still says this because the US has billions of dollars in Tamiflu stock market. There are people who still recommend it, and that's fine. Um, I've read it several times this year for people who needed it um, in the hope that maybe it would help. Um, kids that had CP, kids that had CF, kids that had parents at home that had, you know, severe COPD, things like that. Um, but we'll get into it. So CDC officially says you still give it to people who are at high risk for serious influenza complications like pneumonia and things like that. So the CDC on their website still has it. So you're going to get both sides of this, okay? Let me just be fair. CDC officially still recommends it. It's still on their website. Cochrane review, oh, so who's high risk, right? So these are people that are high risk. It's all listed here. Um, people that have severe asthma, blood disorders like sickle cell, chronic lung disease like CF or COPD, right? All these kind of things, right? Um, anybody who's obese, okay, Oklahoma, um, <laughs> right? So I mean, you have to every, I mean, just give everybody a script of Oklahoma. Um, so right, all, all these people are supposed to get. It. So here's the deal, right? So Cochrane said, Oseltamivir did not affect the number of hospitalizations. You give people Oseltamivir, it didn't affect how people came with hospitalizations. Second of all, it induced serious heart rhythm problems. Um, it did not significantly reduce complications that were serious, right? Um, and so it goes on and on, right? So they had to interrupt. I mean, they, all those guys. You can read it. So it's all in the Cochrane database. But Cochrane said it didn't do anything. And the problem was, it also causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, which if you already have those things and you have the flu, probably not a good idea, right? Um, in Japan, there's been 11 kids that have killed themselves while on Tamiflu, right? Wow. Neuropsychiatric problems, we know that. Um, we've seen it here in America now. I've had multiple kids come in this year. I've had adults come in with delirium. Um, for some reason, I don't know why it's in Japan, but these kids were jumping off of buildings, jumping in front of cars, things like that. The maker of Tamiflu says it's not Tamiflu, it's based on the flu. They had fever, delirium, they jumped in front of the car. It wasn't Tamiflu, but it only happened when they had Tamiflu, not just regular kids that had the flu. I don't know. Right? Correlation isn't causation, I know. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, they did a number needed to treat. You should know what number needed to treat is, right? The number needed to treat was zero because they couldn't find anybody that actually helped. So you'd have to treat everybody in the world to find one person, right? <laughs> it reduces symptoms by 0.7 days, about 16 hours. So if you want to feel better in 16 hours, you can take the flu. Um, 13, so in order to, for prophylaxis, if you have a sixth family member, you need to treat 13 people to prevent one case of influenza, possibly. Again, Cochrane says no, but. This is Tamiflu, also uh, Rose Pharmacy. But number needed to harm for every person you, every 14 people you treat, one will have worsening vomiting, and one out of 20 will have worsening nausea. Um, for every 33 children treated, one will have a notable psychiatric change. So anyway, um, but there is Rapavab, which is the new one. Single IV dose, you give it once. It's active in your system for five days. It only costs a thousand dollars per dose. Okay. Um, BioChrist, who first made it, had to stop their uh, trial because it didn't show any benefit. So they had to stop their trial after six months. Um, the FDA said, "You've stopped it. There's no benefit for the patients, and it costs too much." Um, but you know what? If FDA said it was okay because it reduced them by 21 hours for a thousand dollars, so that's good. Um, and again, Cochrane said it was nothing. So. 
There is a new treatment that may work. It's still an FDA pipeline. It's in third uh, stage trials. And this is a new neuroaminidase inhibitor that's had a little different mechanism of action. Um, and it appears to have fewer side effects. It appears to lower the viral load. Um, inhibits transmission. We'll see if this one actually works. Um, so this is, they're being very transparent about everything with this one and the patient data. So hopefully this will work. Um, so this is, <laughs> I do a lot of uh, Twitter and, and so a lot of my friends uh, are educators and stuff. So we do these post-it notes when I have students. We go through the day and do post-it notes on, on lessons that we're doing. Um, so this is one a friend put up. Um, influenza sucks. So does Tamiflu. <laughs> Seriously, flu sucks. Yeah. Tamiflu still sucks. <laughs> so this guy, he's, a, he's an attending physician up in uh, Maryland uh, at, the, at the University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore. So yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, this was okay. I, I, Valentine's Day. Yeah. Um, it's not an antiviral rant. There's some people that probably do need it. I've written a few scripts for it this year. Um, you just have to know there's a lot of side effects. We saw multiple people come back who were, I had a poor pregnant girl who already had hyperemesis. She got the flu. They gave her Tamiflu. She came back vomiting horribly. Um, needed to be inpatient for like two weeks because of it. I mean, she was already vomiting. They put her on Tamiflu and she just started vomiting worse. Um, I had a little 87 year old lady in the nursing home who got the flu, put her on Tamiflu, and then she started getting really delirious. Fell out of bed, and had a head bleed. I mean, was it the fever from the, from the flu or was it the Tamiflu? She was okay for two days before they put on Tamiflu, and then she started getting delirious and tried to climb over the rail of the bed. Got a head bleed. She had to have a burr hole drill. I mean, so you got to know that there are side effects to medicines you prescribe. Is there a time and a place for them? That's the whole point, right? So get the right treatment to the right patient with the right amount within the right amount of time with the least amount of work. So there's probably a time for antivirals. They may help some people. Um, you know, if you are doing a business deal and you have to be in Tokyo the next day, maybe that 16 hours is worth it to somebody. Um, maybe they're willing. They're not already vomiting and having diarrhea. Maybe it's worth it to them to take Tamiflu. They can afford the 120 bucks. It's worth it to them. They're getting an airplane. Maybe their whole family has something. Um, they have CF kids at home. You know, they cannot risk getting a kid sick. It's worth it to them. So it's not an antiviral rant. It's, it's understanding that not every drug company is up front when they can sell billions of dollars to a pro of a product. Um, and you've got to understand the limitations of a medicine, the side effects of a medicine, um, and other options, right? So hydration, Tylenol, Motrin, rest. And hey, viruses just suck. They always have. Um, and we're getting closer. We may find something one day, but you know, prevention is still the best thing. You know, so um, again, it's not. It's not. It's just do your homework. I mean, Cochrane's out there. All these things are out there to give you information. So um, there's a. This is. This is just a, a guy who writes this thing and sends it out. And you get this mass email once you get on like OAP or whatever. It's this whole thing about the importance of antiviral use for influenza in the ED. But then you read this guy is supported. He's like the major speaker for the for Rapavap. And then you click on that, and he gets over a million dollars a year to speak on Rapavap, which is a thousand dollars per dose, right? But he's talking about how we underuse Rapavap in the ED. Every time I use it, you get part of it. I mean, it's like this is a conflict of interest. So the point is just know what you're reading. Okay? I mean there's a time and a place for everything. Just get the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, at least another part. Um, and what you can do, antipyretics, right? pain medicine for some people, fluids to relieve to, to, for the insensible loss if they need it, right? The breathing fast, the feverish, rest, please stop smoking. We should probably treat the pregnant ladies, but if they're already vomiting, it's probably not the best treatment. Right? Wash your hands, put people in seclusion, send them to Antarctica, something. <laughs> Get them away from me. Hospitalization for the sickest. Right? And avoid antibiotics unless you have radiographically proven or culture proven illness, right? So antibiotics aren't going to help the people with the flu. They're going to cause more problems, more diarrhea, more skin reactions. We said, no, I didn't see it, but one of my partners had a, a person with uh, Stevens-Johnson's because they had the flu, flu positive, 
swab their nose, flu positive, and somebody else put them on Bactrim because of a cough. They said, oh, you may have pneumonia also. Even though their x-ray was negative and they had the flu, put them on Bactrim, they developed Stevens-Johnson, they went to the burn unit and picked us. I mean, so these things happen. Just be responsible out there. Um, and there's no reason for steroids unless they're in the ICU. Yeah? So, so with these, so if a lady does have the flu, yeah. what are the complications of that? Can it harm them at all? It cannot. Harm the baby? Yeah. The baby will only be harmed secondarily. Secondarily. My wife had the flu when she was 38 weeks pregnant, oh. and I thought I, I wanted to die too. <laughs> It was horrible. We were living in New York. It was the middle of winter. There was like two feet of snow on the ground. We were living in upstate New York. It was the middle of winter, and I thought she was going to die. She couldn't walk from the bed to the to the bathroom without like stopping. And, like I thought she was going to die. I did. I took off work. I stayed home. I mean, it was the worst thing ever. Um, I took off work. I just like I'm staying home. I mean, she was miserable. Um, so like, would this type of treatment be like a last resort of yeah. like? Yeah, so she wasn't vomiting, so she took Tamiflu. She, could take uh -huh. okay. she wasn't vomiting. It didn't help her at all. She was she had fever for seven days. She was short of breath for seven days. She was using an inhaler. She was I mean, she was miserable. Uh, but the only thing that was we worried about was the baby, right? So if she was hypoxic, the baby was hypoxic. If she was dehydrated, the baby was going to get poor perfusion. So the baby doesn't get the flu. The baby doesn't get Tamiflu. The Tamiflu is safe for the baby. Um, you worry just about whatever happens to the mom happens to the baby. So keep the mom healthy because they need to be healthy. It's all secondary stuff. So it's miserable though. I will hate. I, I'm just glad I'm there. Yeah. Is there any prophylactic benefit to Tamiflu? I know, like a while ago, I was really sick and I had the flu, and mm -hmm. they had given it to my mom because yep. she was taking care of me. Was Cochran says no. Roche says yes. You got to treat 13 people to get one person to stop one transmission. So, maybe. Um, Cochrane says there's none whatsoever that the mechanism of action doesn't support that. Because it works on the neuraminidase, mm -hmm. it can't support stopping the transmission. That's an HA mm -hmm. hemagglutinin action and not a neuraminidase action. So there's no benefit of stopping transmission. Yeah, you still get it. So, but Roche said somehow magically it works. Yeah. Um, what would make you hospitalize someone, like it, even someone that's just a normal health? Yeah, patient. so elderly, hypoxic, right, so they get it down the rest of the and they're just having problems, they're hypoxic, um, they're very tachycardic, and um, they don't have a support system at home, so they're elderly, live alone, and I'm worried about them going home tonight, and getting dehydrated, falling down, um, keeping food down, they're getting nauseated and vomiting, I'm worried about them just getting dehydrated and keeping things down. Um, Young baby who's working really hard, breathing really fast, and worried about them getting hypoxic. Um, there's not any criteria. So there's no criteria for hospitalizing people. It's purely judgment call. So a diabetic, um, you know, who's vomiting and I'm worried about that, getting a DKA or getting mm -hmm. hypoglycemia. It's it's a judgment call. Purely judgment call. So um, you'll you know you'll learn your first week out there. You know, <laughs> everybody's coming in. <laughs> everybody's coming in. Yeah. yeah. So I was hospitalized for like five yeah. years ago. Oh yeah. For those reasons. Oh, exactly. Yeah. That's very healthy, twenty-something year old. Yeah, you just get wiped out. I mean, you can't breathe. Your, I mean, your lungs get full. You can't breathe. You feel like a weight's on your chest, and a little oxygen, a little fluids. Uh, yeah, helps a lot. So, I mean, we were full. We were full all year, and I couldn't. I mean, we were in Guthrie, and I couldn't transfer people. I was transferring people to Wichita. I was transferring people to Tulsa. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Um, That's fine. Sorry. What, depends on genetic pattern of drift. Uh, under hospitalization, what would you mean? Yeah, so, right, so there's certain H1N1 affects younger, healthier people. So, in 2009, we had hospitalized 20, 30, 40 year old people disproportionately. We don't put those people in the hospital, we put 70, 80 year olds in the hospital. So, H5, H3, those affect <laughs> older people. So, we have a, a tendency to put those people in the hospital more. We know they're going to get, get deeper lung infections, they're going to be more prone to ARDS. So I tend to go, you know, be a little bit uh, gun shy at sending them home. I'll, I'll put a 60 year old, 70 year old in the hospital who's got H3 or H5 sooner than I would. Um, and I'll put a young person in who's got H1 sooner than I used to. Okay. I'll be less likely to send them home if I know it's H1 season and they look kind of mm, crappy. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe hit the night in the hospital, put your observation, you know, just to watch it, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Granted, I understand that, you know, Roach data is kind of yeah. like, okay, it wasn't great. Um, knowing that now, though, I had heard from the AI shadow that mm -hmm. doing human food will need the first 24 hours of hospitalization. That's the other thing, right? You have to give it, all of this Roach data is also based on the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's all based on the first 24 hours. So after that, it didn't even matter. Yeah. So that's if you give it the first 24 hours, too, right? I didn't even say that you're right, exactly. That's based on the first 24 hours. Yeah. Any other questions? That's all. Yeah. Anything else? And the flu. Is that your last Yes. 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 So if you have a patient come in and they're chill and they're just like, I don't feel good, and then you swallow them and they're like, you have the flu, do you just give them like info? Like, I do. Take some pain meds. I do. Relax, I see how they talk to them. I say, hey, look, I do. I really do. I say, hey, you have flu. Um, you know, there is TAM flu. I don't usually prescribe it um, because of a side effect that doesn't really help. They'll knock off like 15, 16 hours. Um, but it's really expensive and it has a lot of side effects. Um, I think it's better to just kind of sit in a room. I'll give you a couple days off work. Just sit in a room and hydrate like you know, crazy. Uh, uh, kind of um, and most of the time they don't want it. Sometimes I'll write for it and then they just take it home and they don't fulfill it. I know for a fact. Uh, but I have, I mean, I have a real conversation with them. And most of the time they say, that's okay. I'll just call I mean, they're very real about it. I tell them, that's not covered by insurance usually. It's 120 bucks. Um, most insurances don't cover it. Some do. But what you have. I mean, it's a real conversation I have with them. So, they usually say, no, it's fine. And most of them don't come in the first 24 hours anyway. Plan, I worked at a pharmacy and we were always out of town. So That's part of the thing too. Always, always a worry. And then it's too late. Yeah, exactly. So I just have a real conversation with them. That's all. You want to just keep plugging? It's up to them. I don't care. You guys, you guys want to just keep plugging? We've got this and um, settings. I guess if you guys need to go to the restrooms. Okay. No. Go ahead. <laughs> I live in New York City first, and then I moved upstate. Like, yeah. First time in New York? Right in the middle of the state. Yeah. Uh, up the west side? I, so I started off in Washington Heights. Right? <laughs> and then I moved down to the upper west side, so 72nd Broadway. Yeah, I started out in the Heights. Where were you doing the Heights? It's on like, I was right by the bus building. Columbia? Yeah. Where were you doing there? Uh, I was a professional dancer in my life, so professional dancer. Yeah. So yeah, I was there, and then I thought about no. Was that you or like? No, it's a musical actually. Yeah, I agree. Really? Dance major, UT, and then danced all over. I knew it for a while. Yeah. But my body was like your school for this, so I was like, that's Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I missed in in New York. I don't miss the MTA. Really? I do. I mean, they would just jump on a train and go somewhere. Wow. So I tried. Yes, but no cars. Yeah. 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 Yeah.